Hello, and welcome to The Digital's Growthcast, where we dive into the future of web design and digital marketing. I'm Carrie Roseman, your host and VP of Operations at The Digital. Today, we're excited to be talking about TikTok ads. Joining me in this discussion today is my teammate, Christopher Lara. Christopher is our SEO manager, and he focuses on um, getting leads from our company website. And we're also joined today by special guest, Nikki Lindgren, owner of Pennock Agency, and Natalie Hughes, a TikTok ads expert. Pennock is a female-led performance marketing agency for beauty, lifestyle, and home goods brands. So let's get started. Nikki and Natalie, thank you so much. Welcome to the show. We're so excited to have you. Thank you, Carrie. It's so great to be here today. Great. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to our audience? Thanks, Carrie. We're so excited to be here today. My name is Nikki Lindgren. I am the founder and managing partner at Pennock. We're a boutique marketing agency, and we help uh, beauty and skincare brands grow their business through efficient paid ads. We run channel agnostics, so anything from Google ads, meta ads, TikTok ads, you name it, any pay-to-play ad placement. My team and I, which includes Natalie, who's with us today, go in and manage for our clients. Great. So what makes uh, TikTok so special compared to all the other social networks for brands? Yeah, um, so I certainly could go on and on about what makes TikTok special. It's kind of, um, it's really a platform that we have unlike any that we really have seen in the paid media space. Um, It's certainly, it has hybrid capabilities um, because in addition to really just running ads, um, it's a full service like e-commerce center. So it's really a strong powerhouse because in addition to running organic efforts, we have paid efforts, which all integrate into even um, like the TikTok shop feature. Um, So it's really a powerful tool that it does a lot at once. Um, so there's, those are just some of the things, um, but there's, there's quite a bit that I'm sure we'll dive into, including um, the ability to connect with creators is a huge, a huge thing that makes TikTok um, different as well. And just that authentic, um, the authentic style of the content that you see on TikTok itself. What are some of the challenges that brands face with this? TikTok ads, um, like, are there any common mistakes? Definitely. Um, I think because TikTok is a little bit new, um, as far as just that, that different angle that it takes, um, I think, um, certainly some common mistakes would be one. Um, I think the biggest mistake you can do is not try things. So it just takes a little bit more of, um, creativity and kind of putting things out on, you know, out there, um, throwing things on the wall, whether that be with, creator partnerships where you're actually having somebody do that for you or whether your brand is developing pieces in house um, or even to the way that like you actually set up your campaign. So not trying um, would be a common mistake, um, not not moving with the trends that are there. Um, taking too long or having too long of content would maybe be another one. TikTok's obviously a very fast paced world um, where you want to be, you know, attention grabbing very quickly. So um, those would be some of the things. Yeah. And I'll maybe piggyback onto that a little bit. And I think like just stage setting again, why one of the reasons why TikTok has kind of um, propelled the ads uh, industry forward a little bit is it's really forced marketers to think outside of the box when it comes to creative and what creative is going to resonate. I think we all got really used to over the last five years, let's say, running ads that were very sales driven, very direct response, like buy this now, here's a promo code, these are my um, unique selling propositions, here are my features and benefits. And things like that don't resonate on TikTok, at least from the brand's perspective, right? Meaning like a brand can't go in and create assets like that and be like, slam dunk, this is the best ROAS generating the highest MER of anything we have out there. So it's really forced in-house marketing teams to think through ways to move people through the phases of awareness from un- fully unaware, not even problem aware, all the way through to like, I know the brand, I know the features and benefits, and I'm going to go buy today. And so it's really just been this additional track of touch points with customers that we just didn't have to do before. Um, and so I think that in itself and the testing and um, processes Natalie was just talking around about, like, we've got to keep trying new things on this platform because it does 
evolve and progress much more quickly than anything we've seen in the ads lane historically. So what types of content have you found work well with TikTok ads? And are there any specific formats that uh, that resonate more with TikTok users? Yeah, definitely um, kind of going back to, you know, the mention of, of creator content and what makes TikTok so special is um, leaning into the content that's that's available or can can be made by actual um, partners who are willing to to do that creation. And so within that, there's a lot of different, um, you know, hooks and styles. There's like a get ready with me approach. There's the, um, you know, step one, step two, how to use sort of style there's using trending sounds so there's a lot within that but i would say again the the common theme and the most important thing is um leveraging those that sort of user generated style um for the ads themselves um Another thing that I would point out here is that um, so there in TikTok there's something we call spark ads, which um, essentially means that the ad or the the piece of content has been posted somewhere already, whether that be the brand is posting it on their TikTok page or a creator or partner is posting it on their TikTok page, um, and then we can can pick that up with paid pay dollars behind it um, and run that as an ad. And what that does is give us, you know, some insight into the engagement um, and some really good key metrics before we even spend any dollars behind that piece of content. And really those, um, those like I said, we call them Spark ads. Um, those just do much better across the board. Um, typically they have a 37% lower cost for action and a 69% higher um, conversion rate than um, an ad that you would just, um, what we call like a dark post where, or where you would just post the ad, um, you know, immediately with paid dollars behind it and it's not anywhere else sort of organically first. And cool. then we'll dive in here too, Christopher, and just say like, there's so much going on in the lane of UGC and creator generated content. And it's such a buzz. It has been for a couple of years. We'll see how long the trend continues. But I think from a marketer's perspective and a brand's perspective, uh, it's one thing to go out and get the creators. It's another thing to come up with a strategy and a way to implement and execute that makes sense for the business. So what we like to guide brands on doing is figuring out like what hooks or themes, angles, if you will, you'd like each creator or user generated piece of content to focus on so that you're in the driver's seat of the types of hooks that are going to be used in your messaging angles. Um, we've seen a lot of brands get started saying like, hey, I'm just going to go out and get creators and give them my product and like, we'll see what happens. And um, sometimes that works, but oftentimes it's a recipe for disaster because there wasn't a strategy in place for it to be successful. So, you know, simplified story is if you're going to work with creators, make sure you have a strategy in place to, to fully execute and implement on the use case of the creator in the first place. And as part of what your HC does, um, going out and helping companies find these creators? We've assisted with that for a few of our brands. I would say our brands being in the beauty and lifestyle space so heavily, our brands really want to have a little bit more control over who they work with, who represents their brand. So oftentimes our brands take a heavier lift into finding these creators. Um, mainly because it's not just for paid ads, right? It's going to be. So it doesn't always make sense for an outside vendor to do that work for the brands. But I think it really uh, boils down to how invested in like this brand ecosystem and aesthetic that each of our clients needs to maintain. So how can brands uh, create ads that, and that don't just sell products, but also engage and entertain the TikTok community? Yeah, I don't know if um, anyone's ever been, you know, scrolling on TikTok and you may not even really realize that what you're looking at is an ad. Um, but that is probably that first point of engagement is, um, you know, just spreading the message in an authentic way. Um, and those can be some of those like trendy moments where, um, you know, where um where a creator is doing something with the product and, um, you know, then, the, the, you know, the products, um, you know, announced a little bit later on in, in that piece of content. And then, 
Um, and that just is through the entertainment piece, really, and truly is um, if it's entertaining um, and authentic, then users are just more likely to connect with it. Um, and so, again, that might be done through storytelling or a get ready with me where someone's inspired by maybe like the whole the whole look that they're seeing. But then there's this, you know, but but they are um, really advertising the product as well. And so um, actually TikTok's slogan is, is don't make ads, make TikToks. Um, so it's really just about that, making it fun. Um, there's ways you can, you know, use the comments and, and the social interaction that's happening to then turn that into, um, you know, really an ad um, that doesn't just sell the product, but it takes a deeper dive into actually the conversations happening around the product or the, the content itself. Um, so Target, if you're listening, I'm already wearing your shirts. So, <laughs> you know, send me some. I'll do Get Ready With Me. It'll be amazing. <laughs> You'll love it. So for brands just getting started with TikTok ads, what's your top three pieces of advice to get them started? Yeah, I'm happy to dive into this one. So um, really the theme as Natalie already outlined for TikTok in general is don't make ads, make TikTok. So I think to the point where Christopher was just talking about getting um, some products from Target, like it's really that type of content, right? So if it's not going to stop you as a marketer in your tracks, like just don't put it out there. It's not going to resonate. So to get started, the first couple things I would do is have a little bit of a backlog of posts that you're planning to share or TikToks you're planning to share organically that you as a brand can spark from your brand's organic content page. That's going to work a lot better than running ads purely from the back end from the ads management platform only. Um, and the reason is because you get different metrics when you're sharing things that are traditionally called boosts on meta, but called sparks on TikTok. So I would start with that. Have a have a handful of those organic posts ready. Have a couple creators ready that you can pull forward into the ads platform. Um, set up on all ads platforms seems to be overly clunky. It's one of the major pain points in our uh onboarding relationship with clients, I would say, um, making sure your business account is set up to connect your organic um, TikTok profile with your ads profile is important. And if you are running an e-commerce store, setting up TikTok shops so people can convert directly on TikTok shows wildly different uh, results and return on ad spend for clients than just pointing everyone to e-commerce. So I would say spend a good week really kicking the tires, making sure all of the connect accounts are talking to each other, making sure the accounts are set up optimally while prepping these five to 10 pieces of content that you and creators can share. After that, you can start campaigns on TikTok um, for as little as $50 a day. If you set up one campaign with multiple ad groups, you can even stretch dollars a little bit further and start with less. So I would recommend people get in there with their new Spark assets and watch them every few days looking for engagement rate, video completion rate, click-through rate, and then ultimately sales. And you'll be able to understand your baseline and the outliers within, I would say, five to seven days and start to know in what direction to dial as a symptom of that first pass of running campaign. Something that I think is is really important to to stress is the patience that it may require and and giving it time. Um, not only you know maybe maybe that doesn't mean let one piece of content run forever, um, but giving the overall you know platform time that if you're doing all of these things with time um you just never know when your viral moment may occur and that may take a little bit of signal building that may take a little bit of engagement happening you know and so um yeah i just wanted to add that point of of giving it time because um you know there's a there's a case study i'm thinking of with a particular client where um they were just willing to have that patience and although you know we didn't see roas immediately um after six months we did not only see the roas there that we like to see um, of, you know, three to five, maybe on, on a normal time, but also um, way larger than that um, during seasonal times. And then a halo effect happening for the rest of their business, because it is such a strong awareness tool that not only did we see it impact, you know, just just TikTok um, success, but across the board, it, it contributed to seeing our other platforms and our, just our overall top line do well. Um, 
Yeah. And I'll dial back in there too. So I think it's true that the patients on the platform should exist. Um, so Natalie in lockstep with, with what Natalie said there, I think the difference is around creative pieces themselves. You can learn faster, but there's one really important catch. Um, whoever's setting up the campaign really has to understand the objective that they're deploying on the platform and making sure they're measuring metrics related to just that objective. So if you're looking for video views, a video completion rate, um, average time watch, things like that are going to be the most important. If you're looking for e-commerce sales, it's going to be a different story, right? So um, when you're setting up these campaigns, it's really important to look at the main KPI that the objective is set up against and not get cloudy vision with all the other metrics that are available within the platform. So do you find that our, our TikTok ads most beneficial for businesses that have a product to sell or can, are they also helpful for maybe service businesses, um, you know, that are looking for leads. So should they, should they consider TikTok ads if they primarily are looking for leads and not selling a product? I, I would say yes. I think all brands should try TikTok and should integrate it into their marketing strategy. I think um, when we're talking about local versus sort of um, like a larger targeted area, it may become, I would say that's probably the brands that have the largest challenges if it, you're like a brick and mortar business where mm -hmm. audience pool is just limited. Um, but even then there's there's ways to, to target the appropriate area. Um, but as far as service goes, I think I think services are a great, um, you know, it's a great avenue for, for them to be advertising on TikTok as well, because you can be taken behind the scenes, you can see a progress, you know, you can do a lot through the content pieces itself. And so um, if leads is the objective, um, certainly we've seen success with, with leads for both service and e-commerce industries. Yeah. And Carrie, uh, there is a lead objective. So you, the platform can collect leads on platform. So that makes it nice for any type of business if they're trying to grow their user base. And then while, you know, many times local businesses have a harder time with marketing because CPMs are generally higher when the audience pool is so limited by geography and or other factors. Um, but the great thing about TikTok for now is their CPMs are still so much more affordable than what we see on competing social and um, visual ad platforms. So what is your favorite TikTok ad that either you guys have uh, helped had a hand in creating or just that you've seen out there in the wild? Yeah, I'll go first. Um, there was this trend last holiday that I believe was called Croquette. It was basically people tying little bows around everything so like a bow around your french fries just like bows on all day every everyday objects and consumables and we had a brand that went out and really took advantage of this before it kind of peaked and they were packaging their um products with these bows in a video and it just caught on and those are kind of those wildfire moments where um having someone who really uses TikTok as an everyday consumer has a has a for you page that's probably filled with different content than if you're logging in through your company's profile is important to keep an eye on because we do find riding the waves of the trends can be really, really beneficial. But if you catch the trend at its peak or basically there, it's kind of too late to take advantage of it. And so on our team here at Penock, we've got a, a member who's really active on her own TikTok. And she um, really looks for things that have between 5,000 assets against it, whether that's a sound or a trend or whatever, all the way up to like 100K assets against it. But once it's kind of exceeded that 100K mark, it's usually a little too late for us to take action on it because it's going to take us a few days to, to create the asset, to do the thing with it. And it may have come and gone by that. And so it's it's really that iterative testing is important when you're trying to ride the wave. Um, and so that's, that's just something I would say was successful for us, but it was a risk to go after this bow tying trend because <laughs> we didn't know if we were going to hit it or miss it. So how important are influencer collaborations uh, in TikTok marketing and how might that play into a brand's TikTok ad 
Yeah, I think, you know, the creator angle with TikTok is highly, highly important. Um, they even have the affiliate angle within the platform too. So I think selecting partners who are going to do your brand a service and not a disservice is really, really name of the game here. And whether or not you set those up as like a one-time collab or an ongoing affiliate, you know, TBD, it's probably a little risky to have an affiliate out of the gate without seeing that they're on brand. I'll give you an example. We um, were talking to a brand in the um, in kind of like the essential oil space and they found a great creator and the creator kind of started talking about political things and maybe um, even, um, you know, uh, religious things that weren't necessarily bad, but it wasn't part of the brand's aesthetic and vibe. And so they were really excited for this affiliate partner and it ended up that the video trailed off into political and um and other topics that just didn't make sense for the brand to really take advantage of because it was not what they stood for yeah one thing i'll add too is um tiktok makes sure that like in their educational pieces they really define the difference of a creator and and an influencer um, just because someone has influence doesn't mean that their creation cannot be just as successful. Um, so one, it's good to have sort of a different range of those with, with different follower counts. It really depends on the objective that we're trying to achieve, how important it is that the that the creator or, or the, the affiliate has a large following and how big of an influence they have. I think it can be great, but also just to keep in mind, um, you know, that some of the, the smaller influencers, if they're great creators and, and they really know how to kind of pull out that story, uh, maybe just as effective or maybe with their small audience. Um, that's why it's important to look at their engagement rate because it could be that um, even though they have less followers, their engagement rates are much higher. And I've actually seen that happen where um, one of our brands had both a large macro influencer and a really somebody who just gave them free content to try out. And we we said, why not? And actually the the piece that came from the the free partnership ended up performing a lot better with their 1500 followers than than the large the larger asset um so just just an example there and you know the influencer collaborations i think are important but but like nikki said just to be really strategic as to why you know what the importance and and what um you know why selecting some of those that are in more of the macro space do you like any of the creator connection services out there i'm not exactly sure what the the influencer yeah the creator platforms. marketplace yeah yeah they, they call it the creator marketplace i think is maybe what you're referring to there um and yeah i, I mean i would recommend it especially for brands who maybe have a little bit less time to do the manual reach out it's a service that's right there and it's like it's like a like a dating app for brands and and for creators, you know. It's like you can find each other, and um, what you get out of that is the creators themselves are typically usually like very um, interested in the sort of products that they might be seeking um, because they can go on there as well and pursue brands just the same way that brands can pursue, you know, people who align with their messaging um, and who they would find to be a good um you know advocate for their brand and on there too you can um you know all the negotiation and the payment and everything happens right on pro on platform as well so it just sort of helps streamline all of that administrative work that would go in, in behind those partnerships yeah and the the one on tiktok is obviously geared towards tiktok there's a lot of um ugc type products out there that can kind of span both Instagram and TikTok, if that is of interest, it just usually comes at some sort of, you know, baked in cost of using this, the service and the software. Yeah, we've looked into a couple of them. I was curious if you had one that you liked or preferred, yeah, not I think specifically for TikTok, but the third party ones. Yeah, our smaller brands seem to be okay with Billow. Their price points, I think, are the lowest in terms of um, platform service costs but um as as brands are scaling up they're using things that are a little bit more sophisticated like a grin um and then tracking things through something like tribe dynamics but i think for getting going below would be fine and um even the creator marketplace on tiktok specifically great thanks um
So could we talk about TikTok shop for a second? Um, do you have any firsthand experience with TikTok shop? Yeah. So we are running ads for the brands of ours that are on TikTok as an ad platform are taking advantage of TikTok shops. And so the, you know, there's always some pain points in getting these things going too. So getting onto TikTok ads is one thing and then getting integrated into the shop, which doesn't have a seamless one click integration with Shopify, where most of our clients are like Meta Shops has, has been a little bit clunkier of a setup experience. The return on ad spend and the benefits of being there just far outweigh the couple of hours of administrative time it'll take to get there. So we're talking about return on ad spend that's like 37% higher than it is when we only push people to the e-commerce store. So the cost savings to the brand is really significant to get there. And so any brands of ours that feel comfortable selling on TikTok shops will definitely point our ads there uh, in favor of pointing everything only to e-commerce. When TikTok shop integrates with Shopify, if you have that connected, you can manage everything in Shopify. Is that how, does it just feed right in? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. I would just add um, a big, a big piece of advice for the TikTok shop is, I mean, everything Nikki said, and certainly, you know, take the time administratively to set it up and then do a couple tests. Um, there's just a lot of settings. Um, and I would say one challenge just for anyone listening who may be banging their head on a table at some of the, the process that um, TikTok is, I think it's just because it's the e-commerce side of things is newer. Um, there, you know, the skew and kind of like the naming process is something that just needs to be fine-tuned. So, um, like I said, just just outlining that time administratively to go through that, and then doing some test runs to make sure that the operational team knows how to fulfill an order and everything. We actually saw um, the opening of a shop result in sort of like a back backflow of orders. Um, so, you know, but that just took a little time to kind of um, pause it. You know, made sure everything was understood operationally and then um you know got things live again awesome. cool thanks for sharing that um any secrets to scaling the secret to scaling is having the level of patience um to watch the changes at a campaign level come through and in, in the meaningful way you want whether that's a cost per lead or return on ad spend that can take a little bit of time to stack up uh, and then I think it's just a level of commitment. So the minimum you can spend there per week, I believe, is $140. Um, so just making sure the team is in it to stay committed during the test time frame. Um, Natalie alluded to this a little bit, but generally speaking, we wouldn't recommend someone go on and off within a two-month period. It would be set it up, let it run for two months, um, continuing to optimize and add new assets into the mix, ideally spark assets. Um, but that would be the real recipe for success. Let's say we're a company and we're coming to you and we're, we're looking to get started, but we're, we're scared of being overwhelmed. How would you guide us in, in starting with TikTok? Yeah, so TikTok can be very daunting and overwhelming. There's a lot of steps we talked about today and things to keep an eye out for. And I think once you're committed to making a test investment into TikTok, the right thing to do would probably be looking for an expert who has experience on the platform and in your vertical so that they can have the shortcuts to the things that might take you a lot of time. We talked about setting up TikTok shop that takes a decent an amount of time and some some test orders and and so on. We talked about following um, real time trends and things that are peaking versus business as usual types of content you can get from creators and from the brand itself. So I think what you're going to get when you're ready to make the investment from a boutique agency like ours is um, is a path towards strategic success. And that's going to vary a little bit client by client. So if you're already in the phase where you've got a lot of website traffic coming to your to your site, you've got a great lead funnel, we would probably focus a little bit more on direct response to get people to take the action you want. If you're a newer business that is lacking a little bit from awareness, we would spend a heavier in that level to get you that level of awareness from TikTok because we do have proof that the engagement and interest people on TikTok have is a lot more compelling than the metas, the Instagrams, the Pinterests, 
even read it. So I think if you're going after awareness, there's still a really good angle on the platform. But all that's to say is there should be a commitment of comfort around a test, a time frame of the test, and a willingness to maybe loosen the rails in the guideposts around brand aesthetic a little bit to find success on the platform. At what budget does it make sense that I would start seeking out a agency like yours? Oh, that's a fair to? question. I think any spend levels, let's say below like 10K a month in spend, you might be better looking for someone on Upwork or Fiverr. Um, but when you're ready to commit above 10K, boutique agencies such as Pennock could be good fits. Um, but a lot of, you know, a lot of brands will want to wait or agencies rather will want to wait to work with you until you're spending 40 plus K. And so it really just depends. And that doesn't have to be one platform. That could be a couple of platforms. But I would say TikTok alone, you would benefit um, working with a, an agency, even a small one after you're ready to commit to 10 And you mentioned a few times the importance of, you know, giving things time to test and, and starting to collect data and results. And, you know, as as us as an agency, we completely understand that. Um, but as a business owner, what, how many months should I be prepared, you know, to, to give things a proper go? Yeah. For us, we believe we'll have directional indicator of it, whether or not it's going to work um, for sure within two months. And then whether or not it's going to be a profitable channel, we usually can start to gauge at a three month mark. I will tell you, at least in the e-commerce space, something we're going to keep an eye on for the brand is what their MER is, which stands for Marketing Efficiency Ratio, and that's total e-commerce sales divided by total spend. This would be spend on any and all paid ads, not just TikTok. But the idea of keeping a pulse on that is it's going to show that even if you're investing 10% of a 30K monthly budget into TikTok, we should be able to continue to hit the same MER you hit before because the other initiatives on the metas and the Googles should be establishing your you know, best business as usual KPIs while you stack up this test over here on TikTok. So really the integration of an agency should be maintaining an MER baseline that the brand needs while gearing up for long-term growth. Nice. And three months doesn't sound that bad. Um, I mean, if, if it, you were to engage in an agency to help you with your organic SEO, I mean, it, it's going to take at least that long before you start seeing results. Um, can you talk and tell us a little bit about uh, SEO efforts within TikTok? Yeah. So I, you know... I'll, I'll tell you what I've observed in the industry, and that is a growing trend of especially younger generations utilizing TikTok as a search engine. And so they'll go there and say, what kind of plant food do I need because the leaves on my plants are turning yellow? Something like that someone's going to look on Google and or TikTok for. And so as you're producing content, uh, TikTok is listening to the to the vocals you are saying the words you are saying but it's also looking at the description and the text you are inputting into your TikTok video so you want to without being SEO spammy and keyword spammy make sure that the video text and the words you're saying are the audio are speaking to someone who might be searching for how do i get my plants to turn plant leaves to turn green again so let's say that i were um just wanted to have these digital go into tiktok a little bit harder in 2024 would it make sense for me to possibly cut up this podcast into the different questions we ask and sections and upload them as individual posts within tiktok to get some of that search volume that would be a really good you, just, you just gave me more to do <laughs> I'm sure you weren't busy enough, Christopher. So are there any like SEO best practices for TikTok? No, I think it's really the obvious things like Christopher and, and yourself, Carrie, as SEOs, you know what people are actually going to search for in, you know, in, in the actual written text. So if you're hitting on those, I think you're good. It's sort of like... I was just watching a TikTok earlier today and it was an SEO guy talking about how the 2007 strategy of 
just writing blog posts, posts around frequently asked questions and answering all of those, like that would be a great, a great thing for a service product or even agents, you know, agency business like yourselves to be doing is what are the common objections for people not wanting to move forward um, with the service, the product, whatever, and cutting those into a handful of short TikToks would be a great move. Would adding background music that, because I know with TikTok, you can also search by like um, music used in a post. So let, let's say, you know, using my example, I cut up this podcast into individual segments for a post on TikTok. Would adding some background music help me at all reach a wider audience or just pointless? Yes, it absolutely would, assuming you are not going after something that's already saturated. So this is where um, our our person who is active on TikTok is looking at how many posts she's seeing in the For You page, utilize the same sound, and then any of those sounds that seem to be trending but under 100K uses are the ones she'll deploy for videos. Um, so it's really kind of looking at really what's happening in real time on for you from a sound perspective and making sure you're not too late to the game. Are there um, any scheduling tools that you use for TikTok that help you plan things out, especially if you have a lot of clients and a lot of posts, or do you have to do everything in the native app? Yeah, well, so Carrie, we don't do the organic TikTok stuff. So I don't know that I'm the okay. best person to ask this question to. What I will tell you from our ground level employee who is of the TikTok generation, she um, doesn't think the cadence has as much of a factor here as other places. So sometimes just like 7 p.m. her time on a Friday night, she'll load a bunch of content up and it, it seems to have less of an impact than it would on, you know, the cadence and the scheduling rhythm of other social platforms. Okay, that's good to know. So thinking of social media, uh, SEO I, uh, and cadence, I, I know with, for example, LinkedIn, in our observations, um, I forget the exact metrics, but if a post gets X amount of likes within, I think it's within that first hour, um, it has you know, a higher chance of, of going viral. But after X amount of hours, and again, I forget the exact number off the top of my head, um, gaining a bunch of likes really won't move the needle at all. It doesn't matter. Um, so do I understand you correctly that that might not really matter as much for TikTok? Yeah, that that doesn't matter down to like the hour as much on TikTok. I can say we've seen brands and uh, people post and then remove it because it probably didn't meet their gauge of whatever success looked like. But, you know, for a brand that doesn't really have a presence on TikTok, going back to the ads and like sparking all of those initial posts at the beginning so that they hit that level of traction you want is also a recipe for success, right? So like on average, if you get 200 likes and you can spend 40 bucks and get 6,000, like why wouldn't you do that, right? And then you can see like, well, how close to 6,000? I don't even know if it's, it's probably views. Um, sorry for like complicating. Then you can more easily decipher what is success and isn't success if you're putting the same spend level against every single spark you're doing. And that can help show you more quickly than waiting for the organic love to come through. I'm sold. I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll uh, look into getting the digital more active on TikTok. Yeah, we definitely think of TikTok first in our ad strategy now. So it's not how, how will uh, Instagram ads perform? It's what can we create for TikTok? And then how can we carry this over? How will we have to like edit and, you know, optimize for different platforms, but leaning into TikTok first, just because, um, yeah, the engagement is there. The metrics are coming in really favorably from a, a profitability perspective too. So it's a win-win for us. And um, we're kind of excited to not have to focus so heavily on meta. It really caters towards what you're consuming and is, you know, isolating each part of when you move on for the next video. And it's funny, I tell my team this a lot, but I've got three small kids and like, they'll go on my TikTok and they'll start watching videos of like bunnies eating carrots. And so for a couple of days, I'm like inundated with animals. And like, you know, by the time they see me pass through them very quickly, it moves on to like normal Nikki content. But, um, you know, they think I'm suddenly like a bunny lover and you know, I have to, I have to 
turn that part of the algorithm off. Um, and this is like a rhythm I work through with my family on a regular basis. You know, I wasn't quite like the user that Nikki keeps uh, associating on our team. Um, you know, I was born into the millennial generation where it's like, we're expected to kind of be on there, but yet like, it's just not quite the same as like Instagram and meta. And so I find myself like playing on my TikTok certainly because there's just so many features. And at first I felt a little bit like silly and disoriented because it's just a little bit different when you put stuff together. But once you start just playing with it is basically the key, you know, just playing with the different features and, and creating Um, if you're actually looking to like, create the content yourself, whether personally or, or for business. Yeah, we didn't talk about audience targeting. And there's usually two camps by where you're going to test audiences. And it's going to be every audience test is against a broad, pretty undefined audience, and one or two granular audiences. We find the most success with granular audiences are actually based on hashtags. So if we're interested in someone who likes plants, it would be any hashtag variation for like an outdoor gardener, an indoor plant lover, whatever. That's probably going to perform better than saying that they like the plant department of Home Depot. I'm just making it up. But like the hashtags are usually going to do a lot better than going after like these more general ways of which you could back into an audience. And that's a wrap on today's episode. A huge thank you to Nikki, Natalie, and Christopher for joining us today and for sharing their valuable insights. So Nikki, what's a good way for everyone listening to get in contact with you? Yeah, visit our website. We're penock.co. That's P-E-N-N-O-C-K dot C-O. Great. And be sure to follow us for more educational episodes here on The Digital's Growthcast. If you have any questions or want to learn more about how we can help your business thrive online, visit our website at thedigital.com. Thanks for listening.